OK, um, a few things. Um, biggest thing uh, is that both the project and the homework are released. So you go to the projects page, you can find the starter code here. Uh, and I'll take a couple minutes to just talk about it at the beginning of class. So um, we're back to the cache simulation thing. But for this time, we're adding a prefetcher on top. So we're going to um, be adding additional functionality. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't think far enough ahead to realize I should probably just give you the whole starter code for this project, for both projects. Um, so you'll probably have to copy paste some stuff uh, from your old code into this new code base. Um, but Theoretically, all you need to do is copy anything you change in main, copy anything you change in the memory system, and then uh, copy your um, LRU replacement policy implementation, and that should be enough to complete this assignment. Well, I mean, complete the, the stuff that you've already done. There's a few other things. Namely, you have to implement a couple different prefetchers uh, that I predefined. So the adjacent prefetcher. This prefetcher, as is described down here, um, just grabs the next cache line whenever you access a given cache line. And then sequential is where you um, grab the next end lines instead of just the next next line. So if you access the ca like cache line one, you would you would go and access uh, prefetch. Uh, cache line two and, and three and up to however many n is. And then, uh, so, so that's like 40%, but most of the grade comes from this custom prefetcher, which is basically you are going to read some different papers. Um, you can also look up any other academic literature if you feel so inclined. Um, and then once you've read these, then you can develop your own prefecture. Um, there's a few components. First of all, you have to actually implement it. Um, so that's going to be probably be a lot of it. But uh, a big portion is going to be on the documentation. So there's a few questions that you must answer. Um, just kind of describing how your prefetcher works and um, why you chose it, etc. Also, that it, you know you have to prove that it can be implemented in hardware. And um, this is pretty key. Don't don't just fluff it up with fancy words, or else. I mean, there's there's almost sixty of you, so it's not like we can read all of them uh you know many like we can't read tons of uh, uh five paragraph essays on this um so please be as minimal as possible while fully communicating all of the um all of the questions and if you if you just add fancy words for no reason uh or kind of fluff up your sentences then you will probably be penalized um and the last piece of this custom prefetcher is we're going to compare all of your implementations on some different uh, um, inputs and see which ones perform um, better. And performance is mainly going to be measured in terms of total misses, you know, um, total prefetches, and then you know how many how many are compulsory, how many are conflict as far as the, the misses go. OK, any questions on the project?
Hold chat. What exactly should this code be doing? What exactly should it be doing? Okay, so basically, let's see here. It says kind of this is the this is the crux of it. So after updating the replacement policy state, then the prefetcher gets called, and the prefetcher should prefetch lines according to the specified strategy. I'll, I'll pull up the um, the code real quick to just give you an idea of what I'm looking for. It's structured very similarly to the replacement policies. Um, and basically what you have to do is um, you will get a, get a handle into when a memory access ha happens. And at this point, you go in, you say, oh, okay, let's use whatever prefetch strategy it is. In this case, it's sequential. Um, and then I'm gonna, uh, uh, go ahead and use the cache system mem access function. So um, let me just show you. There's a modification in here that adds a new field that's probably that's pretty important. Where to go? Right here is prefetch. So <laughs> if you don't want an infinite loop, then you should probably specify is prefetch true, or else you'll just keep continually prefetching your prefetched memory accesses, which is probably not what you want. Um, so the idea is that in your prefetch functions, like handle mem access, you could do something like cache system um, uh, mem access and then pass in your cache system and, and access the corresponding line. Uh, and that'll basically, you know, pull that line into our cache simulation, our simulated cache. Did that give you a bit of an idea of, of how to approach that, Wyatt? Yeah, that helps. Okay, excellent. Okay, let me just do this real quick as well. Okay, um, one other thing. So the homework's re released. You probably don't wanna start on it until at least after today, maybe after Wednesday, um, cause it's about this branch prediction stuff that we're gonna be diving into. Um, also, um, I've tried to add more readings. I'll, I'll continue adding, adding more. Uh, I got some feedback about wanting, wanting some more. Uh, extra resources um, and especially from the book because you know kind of required uh, so I'll, I'll try and continue adding the relevant sections here okay let's go ahead and dive in because we have quite a bit of stuff to talk about uh, so last time we we kind of talked about um, we, we started out by just talking about this this uh, idea of multi-threading pipeline Again, this isn't very common in modern processors, but it's a, it demonstrates the, the um, it, it's, it came out of the same um, problem, solving the same problem as we're gonna be solving with branch prediction. So the idea is that we can kind of cover up the fact that we don't really know what to fetch next by just switching to different threads um, on different cycles. Um, the the real issue is just that you have to store so many contexts and uh you know you end up with reduced single core performance or single thread performance if you uh don't have enough threads to fill up your pipeline so we we talked about branch prediction we went through this little um uh, illustration where we saw that with branch prediction We could just guess that we always proceed on to the next instruction. So we just 
always assume that we don't go that we don't need to do a branch. And in cases like this, where our guess is correct, we can just eliminate any stalls. There's just we just speculate that it's going to actually proceed on, and hooray, we were right. Our prediction was correct, um, and we get we get four cycles of improvement. The problem is, uh, what happens if you were wrong? This is kind of where we ended last time. Uh, if we're wrong about our prediction, if we're wrong about it proceeding on to the next instruction, we're going to have to flush the pipeline and start all over. So, uh, you know, we pulled in this instruction, this add instruction, this multiply instruction, and these two load instructions. We pulled both, all four of those in already and started executing them. And then we find out that our branch is wrong. We, we actually do have to go back up here to uh, this orange load up here. And so then we just have to flush the pipeline, get rid of everything and start over with the orange one and, and continue. Okay, so this is, this is the, the problem with, uh, with branch prediction, right? It's pretty costly to guess wrong, okay? Here's another illustration of, of this uh, same idea. Um, so let's just say that we have a, a program control flow that looks like this. We do instruction A, and then we either do B1 or B3, and then we can send you, continue on to D, E, F, okay? So we, we fetch A, we decode A, and then we just, we're just gonna guess that it's branch one. We go to B1. So we do that, then we do D, E, F, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, depending on how long the pipeline is, you know, there may be more or less stages here. And then, uh oh, we have to verify our prediction. Um, at this point, uh, we have we look and see is our branch uh, taken or not taken. And if it's a misprediction, if we actually had to go to B3, we're gonna have to flush out that entire pipeline, give up, and go back to beginning and fetch the correct thing. So fairly expensive, especially since, you know, mo a lot of like uh, Intel processors these days have like 14 stages to their pipeline. Um, some kind of older Intel processors from like the 2000s had up to 20, I think. So yeah, it's pretty expensive if you, if you screw up, okay. So this is just another illustration of the branch misprediction problem. Here's another one. So if we always assume that it's PC plus four, then uh, we can go ahead and um, uh, uh, see that instruction H is our branch. And we just go ahead and fetch um, both instruction I and J, even though we don't quite know whether or not our branch condition is met yet. Um, and then once the ALU stage is over, then we know whether or not this branch is taken. And at that point, uh, if it's a misprediction, if we guessed wrong, we're gonna have to kill off our uh, instruction I and instruction J and, and then fetch the correct thing, fetch uh, the, uh, uh, the target of this branch. So if this branch was going down to um, uh, instruction K, then we would obviously go and fetch instruction K. I'm not sure why it's kind of cut off over there. Oh, well. Um, so these two instructions get killed. We send no ops through the rest of their pipeline and they are just wasted computation. And we proceed as normal. So. Um, that's the idea. Okay, so any questions about this before we talk about the actual quantitative analysis? Yes. So we're assuming that instruction H is a branch instruction. Right, so instruction H is a branch instruction, exactly, yes. And then I and J are part of this branch. Right, so I and J are if we don't take the branch. 
So if the branch conditions is false and we just proceed on as, as normal, uh, if target is the, or instruction K is the, uh, if this branch was taken, it, the condition was true and then we, we jumped to a different place. If the branch was true, you would execute I. If the branch, so if the branch is taken, then it means we do the jump to a different location in memory. So this would be a taken branch where we go from uh, uh, instruction H to instruction K, and we we ignore the fact that we accidentally did I and J. Uh, whereas if it's not taken, that, that, then that means we only go to PC plus four and then PC plus eight. We just continue uh, moving linearly through our program. There's no, no, no changes. So why is it on there? That's a, so the, the question is I and J, are they branching instructions? Uh, so I think that's a bit imprecise to say. So the way I would describe it is these are the instructions that would be executed if the branch is not taken. It's, it's, you kind of have to be a little bit precise with the language here. So then J is the branch that was taken. K is where it jumps to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that could be, you know, a thousand, ten thousand instructions away. It doesn't really matter. We're just labeling them with IJK because K is the next letter. Although most of the time it is jumping pretty, you know, close to it. You know, this is probably an if statement where you either do some add or you do some other add, you know, something along those lines, but it could be a jump to anywhere. Okay, so let's do some analysis of the performance. So if we if we correctly guess, um, there's no penalty, right? We kind of saw that in the first illustration. If we guess incorrectly, we get two bubbles. Um, so that's what we see up here: two killed instructions under our MIPS pipeline. So now we're we're specifically talking about MIPS. Okay, so let's just assume we don't have any uh, uh, data dependency related stalls and we have 20% control flow instructions and 70% of control flow instructions are taken. Okay, so taken again means that we do that jump. We go from uh, instruction H to instruction K, right? And this is actually pretty accurate. Almost generally the majority of control flow functions are in fact taken. Um, so we can calculate our CPI. We just assume our base CPI is one. We're just gonna go with that. Um, and then we see the probability of a wrong guess is 0.2. So that's the control, the number of control flow instructions times 0.7, which is the number that are taken. And if it's taken, then we end up with a misprediction uh, that's the incorrect guess. Um, and then we get a penalty uh, of two additional bubbles, two wasted cycles. So this results in a CPI of 1.28 total. Okay. So the, the question becomes, well, can we reduce either of these two terms? Because these, these are what we want to get rid of. We want to, we want to, if we reduce either of them, the CPI is going to go down, which means that our performance is going to go up. So let's start by talking about this second term, the penalty for the wrong guess. Let's say we try and resolve our branch condition earlier. So instead of resolving it in the ALU stage, let's add some new functionality to our decode stage. So now we do a uh, uh, you know, our equality checks here, and we kind of do our if 
statement check in our decode stage. And we can also resolve where we, we were, where we jump to by, by adding um, the, the jump amount to our uh, program counter. So this would work, right? We would reduce the number of stalls that we would have to do. We'd only have to have one in this case. Um, but is this is a good idea. What do you guys think? Yes, no. This is probably a bad idea. Um, this is going to pretty drastically elongate our our cycle uh, time because it's just going to take longer to do all this stuff to get it out of the register actually do all the if statement uh, comparisons and everything so let's just um, uh, and, and most likely you know even if we only increase this by like uh, 10 percent right or 20 percent uh, total now the fact of the matter is there's not there's not enough of the control flow instructions to offset all of the additional overhead on every single cycle because we'd have to just increase the cycle time across the board. Okay, so let's not do that. Let's do something different. Let's try and reduce this other term, the probability of our wrong guess. And that brings us to branch prediction. Um, there's a few things here. First of all, we have to predict uh whether the instruction is a branch we have to figure out where it's going whether it's going to be taken or not taken and we have to figure out where it will go if it is taken so these are the three things that we're going to have to look at and figure out a way to handle and one key observation is that our target address remains the same for conditional branch, conditional direct branch across instances, okay? So if we have a branch, uh, you know, branch less than or equal to zero, it's always going to the same destination. Um, and that's great. It means that if we, uh, we, it means we have predictability. And whenever we have predictability, well, this is computer architecture, so we add another task. So we're going to add a new task. We're going to call this the branch target buffer or uh, the branch target address task. Uh, and this is going to store the target address um, from uh, previous times that we've seen this branch. And it'll access it using the PC. So let's see an example. So our program counter is here, and um, we look at the address of our current branch, and we go to the to the branch target buffer, and find that entry. And if we get a hit, hooray! That's amazing. Uh, we'll we'll be able. We've already pre-computed our target address. We can just use that when we actually do the jump. Um, and then we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail, which is a direction predictor, whether or not we do take it or not. So let's just assume that it is ta uh, uh, taken, then we, we can do some logic depending on whether it's taken or not. And then um, also whether or not it was hit in this cache. And then that tells us what, to inst what instruction to fetch next. So what have we done here? We've added another cache to find where we have to go. And then let's just, let's just leave this as a black box for now. Um, we also predict whether or not we take it. Um, and then we use that information to tell us what instruction to fetch on the next cycle. Okay, any questions so far?
So let's just go with the same example that I mentioned before with the 70% uh, taken rate and 20% of the instructions are branch instructions, conditional branch instructions. Uh, so we can calculate our CPI. And if we, if this black box just always outputs true, outputs that we do take the branch, what we're going to end up with is that 30% are not taken. So, so that's going to end up um, uh, being the 0.3 here. And then we have times two, and now we have this 1.12. So 70% of the branches are, are taken. Uh, so that's our CPI under this, this system here. Um, and it's nice because we don't have to wait to actually calculate our target address. It's already cached for us. We don't have to wait till the ALU stage or anything like that, or elongate our C code stage. Okay. Um, let's see here. I don't want to go over this yet. So this is a preview of what we're going to get to, but eventually we're going to also be adding in some additional context like uh, total history of where the branches have gone. So this will keep track of the last five branches and see if they were taken or not taken. And then we will combine that information. It'll kind of tell us like if it's, if we saw five taken branches before, the next one's probably taken. We'll combine that with our program counter and then we'll use that to determine whether or not we're taken or not. And this will be a, uh, a bit uh, um, more complicated to deal with. So back to these three things that are predicted. Whether the fetch instruction itself is a branch, that's one thing to, to predict. The direction, and then the target address. So let's talk about each one of these again. The first one, uh, uh, the third one, uh, we can accomplish this branch target address um, using our uh, BTB, using our branch uh, buffer, branch target buffer. The reason we are able to use this is because we can just look up where our target address is using our buffer. That's the point of the buffer. We can go and find uh, where the previous time that we had this branch, where it went. We can also accomplish the first problem, the first thing that needs to be predicted using uh, the branch target buffer, because if there's an entry in the, that buffer, then it means that it has to be a branch instruction. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be in the branch target buffer. Um, we could also uh, store some branch metadata in our instruction cache if we want to do that as well. There's, there's a couple of different ways of doing that, but um, just looking at for the keys in the, in the um, uh, branch target buffer seems probably more uh, the easier option. So the question becomes, how do we handle number two? And, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time because this is, uh, this is the most complicated aspect of uh, branch prediction. So we have a few, a few options, okay? Um, first of all, we can predict the direction of the branch statically. So this is a compile time. Uh, we can predict that it's always taken or always not taken, for example. Uh, we already kind of saw a couple examples like that, where just assume that it's always going to be PC plus four. So that would be the always not taken version. Uh, or we can assume that it's always taken. That would be the always go ahead and jump to the address that is uh, branched to. 
we could also do something you know more intelligent right we could do something like backwards taken forward not taken uh, why do I think that this might be a good a good strategy uh, for loops for for loops for loops yeah yeah because if we're looping a lot we're going back in, in the code and loops are honestly a, most of what everyone writes so yeah of course loops are are an excellent example okay um we can also do stuff like um profiling and then have the programmer or the compiler or some combination thereof um tell the processor whether the branch is likely or not to be taken we can also do stuff just based on the analysis uh, on program analysis so we can look at the instructions and and kind of infer things just from the instructions themselves um, and then programmer based so maybe you can know better whether or not it'll be taken or not and then you can tell the compiler or uh, to tell the processor what to uh, guess the other option is to do it at runtime to do it dynamically and this is you know based in hardware so we would have to implement this in our actual cpu so a couple of things that we could could try is we could just guess that it's going to do exactly what the last branch did so if the last branch was taken we're going to assume that the next branch is taken or we can be a little bit more clever and instead of just having a single bit taken and not taken we can we'll look at a two bit counter which is a little bit more uh, resilient to just one offs then we'll look lastly at uh, global and local and so this is kind of uh, it, not only are we looking at uh, just the history of of the of the branches we're also going to be uh, looking at um, kind of two different levels. We're going to be looking at what is our history of the branches and then predict what are our predictions for the next one. And we'll, we'll talk about all of these. So don't worry if they're a little bit uh, confusing at this point, we'll, we'll get to them as we go on. And of course, we can combine methods, and that's this hybrid idea. All right, so let's talk about these static methods. Um, so there's a few simple schemes we can always just not take. This is really, really easy. We don't need a branch target buffer. We don't need any direction prediction, but it sucks. We get super low accuracy. 30 to 40 percent generally um, this is because you know a lot of loop a lot of things are taken right loops especially now the compiler can lay out code such that the likely path is the not taken path which will lead to a more uh, uh, effective prediction but we're, we're still not going to get uh, be able to be that good on the flip side we can guess that it's always taken so this, um, again, we don't have to predict a direction. We just always are predicting that it's taken, but we do need our BTB because we need to figure out where we go. This has much better accuracy, um, 60 to 70%. And that's because backwards branches, which are mainly loop branches are usually taken and um just for clarity a backwards branch is when we're going back in our in our program when our target address is lower than our program counter which then leads to the the, the next simple scheme which is this backwards taken forwards not taken idea where we just go ahead and say we're seeing so many loops let's just always assume that a backwards jump or backwards branch is going to be a loop so we're just going to assume that that's taken other ones we're not 
uh, going to assume are not taken. Okay. So this leads to the practice uh, on the worksheet, which is what for this code here, um, what is our prediction accuracy uh, for our not always not taken and are always taken branch predictors. Okay. And uh, uh, the first thing to do is we have to kind of deconstruct this code into actual MIPS or pseudo MIPS because then we can properly count the number of branches that we're going to encounter. And then we can properly count how many of them are going to be projected correctly and how many are not. Okay. So, um, The key here is that for loops are going to be compiled a little bit differently than you expect. Okay, so um, what you pro a naive implementation of a for loop would do something like this, right? We have a label like A, and then we have some. Uh, um, initialization up here, you know, i equals zero, and then in here we do um, um, branch if uh, like greater than or equal to uh, four, and then we we go down to like uh, the end. Right, and then we go ahead and in here we do our oops increment, and then up over here we do J M P to A. Okay, so this is what you would think would happen with a um, uh, a, a for loop, right? This is kind of how you how you think of it. When you're actually programming, you assume that uh, at the end of your for loop, you're going to do a jump up to the conditional up here and evaluate it again. That's actually not how it works. Um, let me get rid of some of this crap and make this full screen so you can see a little bit better. What actually happens is all for loops get compiled to do while loops with a conditional on top. Okay, so instead of this, and, and, the, and the reason why this is kind of annoying is, well, you get this extra jump instruction before you get to evaluate the condition again. Um, it'd be nice if we just evaluated the condition before we jumped backwards, because th this is kind of wasteful. We jump backwards, we evaluate it, and then if it's false, then we would have to jump forwards again. So this is kind of pointless. So instead, what's going to happen is ooh, that's not good. I don't want to erase the picture. Right, let's get rid of that stuff. Let's try and do this without erasing the picture. Boom. So what's going to happen is we'll do um, kind of like our our uh, i equals zero, and then we can we can check. Uh, we can do the first check. Basically, this you know if i is less than four, then go to uh, e the end. And so this would this would take care of if if it's false immediately if our condition is false immediately. Obviously, convert this to MIPS, but let's ignore that for now. And then uh, our next instruction would just be let's call this let's call this one A, and this would be doing the actual increment. And then we have to do I plus plus, and then at the end we will go back to the beginning of the loop, we'll go back to A um, if branch less than 
basically I, right? Uh, and then uh, uh, four, we're going back to A, okay? So we kind of convert, converted this loop into a do while loop by adding this additional if on top. And um, that's, uh, that's the way that these are gonna be compiled. Now, there's a bit of nuance with this particular one because this is constant and this is constant. And we always know that zero is less than eight and four. So we're actually just gonna skip this one as well. Okay. So um, let's, uh, let's go through the first for loop together and kind of see how it will be compiled. Uh, let me erase a bunch of stuff. Actually, let's just, I'll just kind of show it here. Okay. These aren't precise, but zoom in and I'll get that up here. So this is our first for loop basically. And uh, we're setting T1 to zero. So that's our I equals zero. Then we go ahead and we'll just call this increment something. We, we don't really care what it is. And then here, we actually do the, the increment, the I plus plus. So um, T1 is T1 plus one. And then we do the branch less than, and I, I've already put in uh, uh, four into T3, so we can just use that to do our comparison. And if it's true, then we go back to B. So we, we just go up here. Ooh, that was a bad arrow. There we go. Okay, and you, I guess you can kind of see the, the rest of it, but um, any questions on, on this? On how, how we translated this, this first for loop? Cool. So back to our question at hand, what happens is in this always not taken case? Um, I'll give you a minute to think about it, um, given this, this understanding of how it's gonna be compiled. A, B, and C are just abstracted levels for actual memory addresses. Yes, that's correct. They're basically just like labeling, you know, if, if we see a B here, it means replace this with whatever actual offset there is to this instruction. I guess I'll leave this. It's not very insightful to do this yourself. Though you should probably learn how to. Um, so just. <laughs> um, so the, uh, for, like for these <clears throat> assignments, you can just ignore the compile. Those all just get front loaded. So right. Compile, yeah, I'm just putting some stuff into a few registers just so we have them available to do our comparisons down here and here and here. Um, for for this check, this check, and this check, uh, respectively. And these these move instructions, I'm just I don't know if it's act, the, the exact proper semantics, but we'll we'll just go with it. The idea is we're initializing the value of this register. Okay, so what do you guys think? 
if we predict that it's always not taken, how many are we going to predict correctly? One per loop? Yeah, yeah. So um, this branch for, for this if statement here and this branch or this one here will not be taken once, right? At the very end of the loop, when we are, uh, are actually now i equals four, then we're not going to take it. So we, we won't, uh, we'll actually correctly predict once on each one of these loops. What about the outer loop? Are we ever going to predict correctly for the outer one? Only the last time, but let's just ignore the last time. We're talking about, I guess I missed a key here. Um, once it reaches steady state, that's why K is, you know, we're going up to a big number, right? So let's just assume that K is somewhere in between zero and, and this very, very large number. But yeah, you're correct. Like the last one the, for this entire do loop will, will be predicted correctly, but let's just look at kind of a, a single frame. And uh, so the other question then becomes, so we have two correct predictions. What, how, many, how many total branches do we have? Thirteen, and where did you get that number? So like you're, you're looking at you, you can branch. You have the option to branch you know, four times for the first four loops, two times for the second four loops, and then the outer and the outer. Four. Yeah. So we 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 have to evaluate this branch four times here. We have to evaluate the second branch eight times, and then we have to always evaluate the last branch. Okay, so um, that's going to be our baseline for this. It's always going to be something out of 13. In this case, it's two out of 13, which is what, 15%? Right? I think I calculated that earlier. Um, Yeah, so 15%. So pretty crappy, right? Um, what about always taken? Again, it's something out of 13 because that's the number of branches that we have to evaluate. Yeah, it's just the, uh, the you know, <laughs> the exact opposite. So 11 are going to be correctly predicted. And so that's like 85. Oh, that was a bad eight. 85%, okay? Okay, so this is a, another example of, yeah, this uh, always not taken is pretty terrible. Let's at least do this always taken approach. That's gonna at least get us something that isn't total trash. All right. So moving on to another option. This is again, a static option. We, we aren't de dealing with any dynamic things yet. Um, and the idea is that the compiler is going to determine the likely direction of each branch using a profiling run. Then it'll encode the direction as a hint in the branch instruction format. Okay, so we're going to have to modify our branch instruction format a bit. The pro to this is that we get per branch prediction. Um, the compiler can set this bit per branch, right? So um, if you, if the compiler can figure out, oh, hey, this one's a lot of times gonna be taken, or this one's a lot of times not gonna be taken, it can tell the, CP, uh, tell the CPU through the instruction format um, which guess to make. And it's accurate insofar as the profile itself is accurate and representative of an actual real world run. The cons are that, well, we have to add more stuff to our instruction format. So now we have 
an extra bit to our instru uh, branch instruction format. Okay, it's not terrible, but it's still kind of annoying. And the accuracy is going to depend on dynamic branch behavior in the end. So if you have a very unpredictable branch, like maybe it's it's true a lot and then it's false a lot, or it kind of oscillates between the two, um, we're going to get really terrible accuracy because there's the CPU is always going to guess whatever the, pr the profile told it to. And if you can't really determine which guess to make, then you're going to, you know, if it's effectively random, then you're going to get a 50% accuracy, which is pretty abysmal. Additionally, even if you were able to, you know, avoid these issues, you would also have problems if your profile itself was not representative. So, you know, for example, if we were um, trying to compile GCC and do this, this profile-based branch prediction for that, there's so many programs that GCC could compile, it's really impossible to like really have accurate, accurately representative profile. Uh, so this is probably, you know, unless you have a very, very specific use case for it, um, probably not necessarily like the best option, but it exists and it's an option that you could attempt. So let's look at some program based uh, heuristics based on analysis of the actual program. These again are static, right? So these don't require any, any runtime uh, estimates or guesses. For example, if we have the if we use the opcode heuristic, uh, we could, for example, predict that all branch less than or equal to zero are not taken. Okay, so we just always assume if we're uh, if we're seeing if it's neg uh, the number is negative, then it's not going to be taken. And this is maybe a reasonable guess because negative integers. Um, are often used as error values. So we assume that there aren't going to be that many errors. So we can maybe assume that any branch less than or equal to Z, zero, um, is not taken because we're probably not going to have to handle an error. Another heuristic that we could do is if we have a, a loop, we could predict the branch guarding a loop execution is always taken. So we always predict the loop will loop back. We could also uh, do some heuristics based on whether or not we're doing pointer or floating point comparison. And if this is the case, we could probably predict that it's not going to be equal and do whatever corresponding branch would result. Um, because generally, you know, floating point, as we all know, is those comparisons, it's very hard to have the same floating point number unless you're, you're uh, you know, uh, uh, like co you literally copied it. Um, this is why you have to do the whole, you know, do the difference and do epsilon and everything, right? Uh, also, pointer pointer comparisons as well. There's just so much pointer space that it's probably not going to end up being equal. So the pros to this approach are we don't require any profiling, uh, so we don't have any problems with representativeness of our profile. The cons, on the other hand, are uh, the heuristics themselves may not really be representative of real world uh, like runtime behavior, right? You know, this sounds like a good prediction, but is it right? Maybe you are dealing with a, a program that deals with negative numbers a lot, just math um, or something like that, in which case this would be a really terrible heuristic. Um, and it also requires um, ISA support and, and compiler analysis uh, to kind of uh, do these heuristics and then actually uh, the, the same kind of ISA support for which guess to make. Okay, uh, 
the last uh, static prediction method we're going to look at is programmer based. So what if the programmer provides the direction? Um, this could be done through pragmas, for example, in our programming in our programming language that qualify a branch as likely taken versus not likely taken. The pro to this is that we don't require uh, uh, any profiling or program analysis. So we get rid of the two problems that we had on the last one, or two of them at least, not all of them. And quite frankly, you as a programmer might know better whether or not some branches in your program will be taken or not, much better than your other analysis techniques, whether they're profiling or program analysis. Um, the con is that, well, now we have to support this all the way up to our programming language, through our compiler, down to our ISA, and it's us doing it. And when, I, I don't know, whenever I get involved with doing programming, things, things, uh, well, let's just not talk about that. So, uh, you know, exposing this, this idea to the programmer, maybe a good idea, maybe not. Uh, just a sidebar on pragmas. Pragmas are just keywords that enable the programmer to convey hints to lower levels of our transformation hierarchy. So, for example, we could, you know, have some kind of uh, likely or unlikely concept, uh, and we could kind of hint to our compiler whether or not a condition would be likely or not. Um, other hints exist as well. If you take Dr. Wu's parallel computing, you'll well, you'll probably learn to hate this or at least uh, um, wish that you hadn't seen it before. I don't know, it's actually kind of fun, but it, it, difficult to debug. Um, so this, this pragma is a different one for specifying that a loop could be parallelized, for example. And it tells the compiler what to do in that case, because uh, the compiler can't really infer whether or not a loop should or should not be parallelized generally. Um, okay, so those are the three main things that, besides our simple um, uh, static branch predictors that we can do. However, we can obviously combine all of these, right? So we could add some profile uh, based or program based or programming based or all three together. Um, Maybe then you have some idea of weighting different different things over uh, over others, right? Maybe the programmer always overrides whatever the profile or program based analysis gave you. There's a lot of different ways that you could combine these. But even then, in the end, all of these problems have one major disadvantage, and that is that they cannot adapt to the dynamic changes in branch behavior at runtime. So if your branch is a 50-50 branch at runtime, even if you have the most sophisticated profiling, sophisticated heuristic, sophisticated programmer, then it's still gonna only give you 50% accuracy, which sucks. Now, you could kind of make a dynamic compiler, but let's not. Um, that's, that's really a lot of overhead and not great granularity. Um, uh, and the idea of a dynamic compiler is like self-optimizing code where you kind of just in time compile your code, for example, whether that's the Java, um, uh, just-in-time compiler or uh, V8 or PyPy or the, or the CLR, um, uh, whatever it is, uh, let's, uh, you know, th these are going to have a lot of overhead just to do this maintenance of the code itself to optimize, to self-optimize. So 
this is why, for example, Java and .NET and uh, V8 and, and Python, right, even through PyPy, are slower than equivalent C implementations, right? Um, so we want to do things very, very fast, and we and we care not about programming languages. We care about uh, architecture here in this class. So let's just ignore these dynamic uh, dynamic ideas. Okay, any questions before we proceed on to dynamic branch prediction? Um, so I've heard of a programming concept called branchless programming. We'll actually talk about that, but not this lecture. So uh, yes, it can pr provide real world speed up. Uh, there's some nuance there. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to it uh, much, much later on. Other questions? Okay. So again, the problem with all the static stuff is it's, it's not gonna adapt to what's happening at runtime. So let's think of another idea. Let's predict our branches based on dynamic information that we collect at runtime. The pros of this are kind of a little uh, evident, right? We have information from the runtime itself, so we can predict based on the history of the execution of branches. So we can look at what's happening currently in our program, what branches have occurred, and we can um, predict, predict based on that. We can then also adapt to dynamic changes in branch behavior. So if it's, if it's true a bunch of times and then it switches to false and is false a bunch of times, we can detect that change at runtime and correct our guess. We also don't need any profiling. We don't have any of those problems with representative sample or incompetent programmers or anything like that. All those problems go away. Obviously the disadvantage is it makes more work for computer architects and requires more hardware and is way more complicated. And as you can see from this little orange bar here, um, this is telling you how long the slide deck is. It's most of the slide deck. Okay, so um, that's the disadvantage. So let's start with a very, very simple predictor, which is a last time predictor. This is going to just store a single bit per branch in our branch uh, target buffer. And it'll indicate which direction the branch went last time it was executed. Okay. So if we have a pattern like this, where we have taken, 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 and then uh, a bunch of not taken, we're gonna get a 90% accuracy because we're gonna assume this first one, let's just say that the first one is always gonna be wrong. We'll just be pessimists. And then this one here, when we switch from true to, from taken to not taken, true to false, if you will, that'll be mispredicted as well, okay? Uh, additional, so, so this predictor, um, it's always going to mispredict the last iteration and the first iteration of a loop branch. Okay. So the first iteration is a taken. So that one's going to be mispredicted. And then the last one, we, we've had a bunch of taken in a row. And then we have a not taken. So that's obviously going to be uh, a, uh, a, a misprediction as well. So if we have an inter in iteration loop, our accuracy is going to be n minus two over n. And so if you have a very uh, large loop, like 10,000 or something, obviously the minus two is negligible. But if you're looping and doing like five or something, it may be a little bit more costly. So the pro is that 
Um, stuff like loop branches for loops with large numbers of iterations are going to be really, really good. We're going to have really great um, branch prediction accuracy. A con would be loop with small number of iterations or if it's just kind of random. So let's look at the CPI of, of this. Let's just assume that overall, even with these cons, we're going to end up with an 85% accuracy. And we're going back to our example from a, like now a half hour, 45 minutes ago, um, where we have 0.2 of the instructions, 20% of the instructions are branch instructions. And now we have a misprediction rate of 15%, and we still get those two, two, uh, two stalls. Now we have a CPI of 1.06. So that's pretty, pretty good improvement over, um, over what we had. So let's look at how this would be implemented. So the first thing to, to know is that our, our um, branch history table over here, um, it's indexed much like our caches. It's, it's direct map though, most likely. Um, though it may not be, depends. Um, it, it, again, it is a cache, so you could implement it just like any other cache. But most likely this is just gonna be direct map. Um, and we index into it just like with our other caches. And then we have a one bit that indicates whether or not it was taken last time or not. We, we push that into here. Um, and then we also have our, our target. And then we select whether or not we take the target or the just the not taken branch, which would be uh, PC plus four. Oops. All right, so here we're storing, again, we're storing our target as well as whether or not we think it'll be taken or not in our um, BTB. Okay. So let's look at a state machine corresponding to this. So we have two states, zero, one, right? Um, in the zero state, we just predict that it's not taken. And if, it, if the branch is actually not taken, we just stay in the state. If it is actually taken, we transition over to the one state where now we'll start predicting that it is going to be taken. And if it's actually taken, we stay here. And if it's not taken, then we, we actually move over to the predict not taken. This is pretty simple to think about, I think. So let's look at our example again and figure out how the prediction accuracy uh, for this uh, would be, what the prediction accuracy for this would be. And uh, let's see here. Let me insert this image for you. Oh, I'll just scroll down. How about that? Oh dear. Whoops. Oh no. I was never that good at kindergarten. Oh, whatever, we'll go with that. Uh, 
Okay. So, any any ideas? What are we What are we seeing? Yes. We would miss the first and last on each each one. So, sort of. It depends, right? So, for this one, we always have to look back to the previous branch, and in this case, the previous branch was down here. So, we're actually gonna. So, so was the last branch taken or not? On this, when we get to the first iteration of this this upper for loop. And we do the comparison of, you know, I have one less than four. What is our what is our state machine state going to be? Considering that this was our last branch that we did. Yeah, so this we're yeah, exactly. We're looking at just the last absolute branch. We aren't doing anything special with like keeping track of each branch individually. That's gonna be later. As I said, the slide deck's long. But great, great intuition, right? Like that's that's the that's the direction that we're trying to go. So yeah, these are just global absolute branch prediction. Um so are we going to miss the first iteration? We're definitely going to be miss the last, as you mentioned. And we're going to miss the last on this one as well. So there's there's already two missed predictions. But are we actually going to miss predict? The first iteration of this one. No, because we have this nice little branch down here, which is giving us a a taken prediction, which will continue on into into here. Um, so I guess we are missing two here, right? That when I uh, on, on on the second branch because we'll be in not taken as we go into the the, the second loop, and then we'll. We'll get a bunch of misses. Let me check that I did that right. See, the problem is when I when I make these things at like two a.m. in the morning. Do, 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 do. Oh, I forgot one other miss. So this is this is going to be missed twice, right? So first and last. And is this one, is this last loop, is that one going to be predicted correctly? This, no. Right, because when we hit this last branch less than, uh, um, then we're going to be in a in the not taken state because of this this instruction here, because we just got off of the getting out of the loop thing. Um, so we're going to be on not taken, and then we're going to hit this branch less less than, and we're going to guess that it's not taken, but it actually is taken. So we'll mispredict this one all the time. We'll only mispredict this one once, though. Okay. So while it's a reasonable heuristic to say, oh yeah, we're just gonna all mispredict first and last uh, for for any loop, you have to make sure to look at also the uh, the whole like um, uh, previous instructions as well. Okay. Now, if we had uh, if we had done like the the guard the if statement guard before the loop before the this do while construct. Then we would have ended up with a, a not taken, and then needed to fix that with a taken. So, um, so the first four loops, are we saying that we're uh, that only missed one time? Or do we also so we this only misses once because this la, uh, the last branch that happened. Once we get up here, 
will have been this branch, assuming that we're in kind of this steady state. K is like some thousand. Right, the first time everything's just screwed. Just like let's ignore the first, you know, few cycles of this for loop or this do while loop, and then let's look at kind of the, the ongoing performance. Okay, so where's my pen? Right, I put it away. Sorry, we're a bit over, but we're at nine out of 13 here. Okay. Um, sorry for keeping you a little long. Uh, you guys are dismissed. I'll stick around for any questions and we'll have off stars as well. Hey, Summer, real quick. Um, I know you talked about the midterm last class um, and you said it was take home. Is it like a take home where we get like some hour to do it or is it just like turn it in during that 24 hours, take as long as you need during the time it's released? Turn it in during the 24 hours. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. What is this? <laughs> 